Good morning, brothers and sisters. I am a uh, co-worker and um, mission leaders from all over the world. Greetings in the Lord from Hong Kong. <laughs> it is such an honor for me to speak on this pulpit this morning. I can imagine if my beloved late husband, Dr. Philip Tang, were still here. He would be so proud of all of your endeavors through these past 40 years to keep AMA ministries moving, growing, larger, broader, and deeper as what we have seen today. Thank you for inviting me to share with you today. As I am reaching my 65, and I am nearly retired, I think I may be quite outdated to talk about innovation. Also, <clears throat> sorry. I come from a small city, Hong Kong, which sent only 563 missionaries last year. So compared to the 410,000 world missionaries, it is really a tiny figure. Although Hong Kong became a special administrative region of China, 19 years ago. Due to the one country and two system policy, an uncountable underground house churches, it's hard for us to collect precise data on the, how many Christian believers and missionaries really inside China. Since uh, AMA committee assigned me this topic, innovation in mission, I can only try my best to share something from my very limited understanding. I think before we are fascinated by all new ideas, new strategies, new methods, new tools, etc., in order to keep up with the pace of postmodernity, it is worthwhile to examine our old mindset, pondering more on conceptual renewal. As what I stated in the abstract, uh, uh, which is in the plenary sections, page 49, you can check it. Our question is, what are the innovative, new, and advanced mission strategies for this drastic, changing world? When I pursued my MA in mission at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield, Chicago, more than two decades ago, I challenged my American professors from the intercultural studies. One of them was my respective mentor and readers of my MA thesis and doctoral dissertations, the late Dr. Paul Hebert. I challenged him and other American professors that the Western definitions of missions were outdated. The topic um, of my MA thesis at that time was re-examine the definition of mission from the Hong Kong even Chinese evangelical perspective. Those theories of M1, M2, M3, or E1, E2, E3, I challenged my professor and said, this should be redefined. 
by where you called it Jerusalem. That is your starting point, starting place. We send out missionaries from here to there, <clears throat> from the reached to the unreached. The category levels only reflect the degrees of cultural differences that need to be crossed. I was so glad that these humble Western physiologists have already realized that cultural differences should be override geographical differences. This theology or theory in the past 20 years, in fact, really helped the Chinese churches and myself to settle some arguments about who should be called missionaries, what places should be called our mission fields, what should be included in our missionary works, and the like. These answers help us to be able to raise our mission funds and to mobilize our mission force. However, after these 20 years, more than 20 years, M1, M2, M3, or E1, E2, E3 can no longer cover all mission dimensions. Globalization swept the world from the late 20th century. That overwhelmed us with rapid urbanization. The word globalization comes from globalization plus localization. Postmodernity and high tech communications, etc. Those kind of arguments about home or foreign, vocationals or professional, cultural mandate or redemptive mandates are no longer issues to us. Christian missions have been developing theories and strategies to face the challenges such as urban missions for vulnerable peoples, local cross-cultural missions for multicultural minorities in mega cities, holistic missions that concern the whole person in both cultural and redemptive mandates, cyber missions that break through the political and religious restrictions, etc. However, from time to time, those questions I challenged my Western professors with two decades ago come back to challenge me today. Where are our mission fields? Who are our missionaries? What are our missionary works? We all are sure that the content of the gospel cannot be changed, but our mission strategies, methods, and tools, so forth and so on, should be relevant to the context of our modern world. So innovation missions are those creative ideas and new things that we have to learn, to learn on the path of mission. So let's ponder about where are our mission fields. According to Joshua Project Global Statistics, there are uh, almost 16,500 people groups in the world and 6,600 plus people groups are still unreached with the gospel. It, um, it's about 40.5% of unreached people groups with the 42% uh, world populations. To be unreached means that the percentage of 
evangelical Christians in a given population is less than 2%. 2% is the proportion thought to be needed to reach their own people. Thank you. Thank you. Therefore, our strategy is to send missionary pioneers to these less than 2% and rich people groups. As Paul said in Romans 10, 14 to 15, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now, nevertheless, globalization and urbanization produce a global village to the 21st century where multi cultural ethnic people groups for political, economic, religions, whatever reasons, migrate and habitat in cities of various sizes. According to the demographia world urban areas, are there are terms called built up urban areas. Uh, this term is the new urban area term now used by national statistics in the United Kingdom. It may be the most descriptive short term for urban areas. These kind of um, areas, maybe we call it different size of cities, uh, they just publish it this month, uh, this year. It wrote, in recent year, uh, I check it, it's the end of uh, 2008, the world has become more than one half urban uh, for the first time in history. 54.5% in this year, uh, 2016. They calculated using UN, United Nations data. Well, we can see the, this. Uh, you, you find that the rural part is 45.5. Uh, 40, uh, that means the other side is different uh, size cities, urban, they call it uh, the uh, built up urban areas. Uh, I counted, that's, a, that's some chart, and I calculated and find it uh, 500,000 populations there in the world by popular uh, population density is 1,022, this kind of cities. But if it is 1 million, population that will have 500 and zero, uh, 507 cities. And the 10 million is 36 cities, but 21 is in Asia. And there are 20 million plus mega cities, 12 of them, but nine is in, a, uh, in Asia. So uh, let's take a look of the 12 mega cities. <laughs> Maybe many delegates are already uh, living in there, like Japan and Indonesia, it's uh, 30 plus millions. It's a lot of people, huh? And then in India, uh, Delhi, Seoul, Malila, Mumbai, Karachi, Shanghai, and Beijing. Only in these 12 megacities, only three 
from the other parts of the world that's not inside Asia. So if you count all the 36 mega cities, totally is 21 Asia, including uh, what I mentioned, the nine mega cities, over 20 million uh, populations. Uh, the other one is Guangzhou, uh, Osaka, Kobe, Kyoto, uh, Dhaka, Bangkok, Calcutta, Shenzhen, Tianjin, Chengdu, uh, Lahore, uh, Bangalore, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, and uh, Yang, uh, Nagoya. Well, these are a lot concentrated in Asia. So when we see another picture, uh, another graphic, yes, you'll find 57% populations living here. So meeting the needs of cities cannot be neglected uh, in this globalization, urbanization world. The Asian areas comprise 57% of the world's vast urban area populations. Compared with the other five continents, you, you can see that. As cities become our major mission fields, urban missions will no longer be as it was, focusing only on those grassroots, vulnerable people groups, uh, like the poor, homeless, uh, drug addicts, troubled, outcast of the societies, etc. But now we have to face the needs of multicultural ethnic minorities or different mixed cultures in this modern world. Uh, make an example, um, in Hong Kong, uh, besides teaching in seminary, I am also involved on the boards of two international mission organizations. Both of their goals are to serve the least evangelized people groups in those restricted areas. However, all these years on the board discussions and most of the problems we faced were visa problems. Recently, one missionary uh, went through the, whole, the full procedure, including raising enough funding uh, and finishing a missionary a commissioning service Everything's fine, ready to go. But unfortunately, her visa at the last moment was not granted. And her name was even blacklisted, although she had stayed in that country for over half a year, not long ago. So it's so difficult. But thank the Lord. Re Regardless of all kinds of difficulties, we are glad that there are about uh, 30,000 of her uh, targeted minorities living in Hong Kong. <laughs> so she can still actualize the cross-cultural uh, missions in her home city. So due to the cultural and language barriers, only 21.1 of Hong Kong churches have certain levels of involvement in local cross-cultural missions because sometimes the mindset, I have to send missionaries abroad to that, those kind of countries. But visa problems, what to do? Always fly to and fro, in and out. In fact, 
she can also do it in the mega cities. Of course, Hong Kong is not a mega cities. It's a small scale, but the very the density is very high. Urbanizations brought so many peoples together. So our mission strategies, our sending or receiving, how to define it, how to relocate our resources. So I think this kind of local cross-cultural missions endeavor should be strongly supported and mobilized. Particularly, um, I, I just would make example, just like Hong Kong, we have about 270 Muslims living in this tiny city. Of whom 30,000 are Chinese, but 140,000 are Indonesia, mostly domestic helpers with the rest, mainly non-Chinese-born in Hong Kong and others from Pakistan, India, Malaysia, and Middle East and African cities, African countries. Indonesia has the largest Muslim populations in the world. But if we apply, we can be tourists there. I've been there. But if we apply to be missionaries, it's impossible. There, Christian in Hong Kong, we try to rethink about how to train local Christians, local Christian churches. We have to face these challenges. Uh, in Hong Kong, during weekends uh, and holidays, you, you, you will find a lot of uh, Indonesian uh, Muslims. Uh, they gather together in the park. They have their worship, uh, Muslim-type worship. And then um, they have different uh, covers and different colors, uh, this kind of uh, uh, religious practices. Since they stay in Hong Kong and enjoy this kind of free cities, gradually they don't have that too, too much host hostility towards the other uh, faiths, the other believers uh, in other faiths. So uh, sometimes I find that uh, our local gospel organizations, they will send local missionaries to approach this kind of uh, uh, Indonesia domestic helpers in the park. Uh, they play with them, they uh, sing with them, and they get approached with them. Um, there are a lot of opportunities to do the cross-cultural work locally. And uh, what I am doing now, I also hire an uh, employer, Indonesian maid, but uh, she's uh, Christian. Then I ha we have agreements that I pay you, you just do, uh, because my uh, husband already went to the Lord, so only me, I don't need a uh, domestic helper, actually, but I uh, discussed with her because she's a Christian. I said, if you uh, can share the gospel to your uh, Indonesian folk, especially those Muslim, I will still hire you. And then part-time, you just do some cleaning and cook one meal for me <laughs> in the evening. And the rest of the time, you go to share the gospels especially to those Muslims. <laughs> we can encourage more this kind of employers. <laughs> so pray for us, and we are rethinking how to face this kind of uh, huge needs.
If I approach them, uh, they, the language barriers, cultural barriers, and, and it's hard for, for me to grasp how to approach this kind of Indonesian Muslim domestic helpers. But my maid, she can just, she just talk uh, their own language, and they know, they understand the culture. Uh, she, so far, she has been very faithful and productive in this special assignment. <laughs> so regarding the visa issues among restricted countries, Howard Culberson, professor of missions and world evangelism in Southern Nazareth University, provides some good suggestions. There are countries where it is not possible for foreign missionaries to get a visa. There are countries where church activities are greatly restricted, and some countries where open evangelism by Christians is completely prohibited. Churches in areas where they have to meet in secret are sometimes referred as an underground churches. Many of these countries are unreached. While fulfilling the Greek commissions in those countries can be challenging, it is not impossible. Closed to missionaries does not mean closed to the gospel. And that's where the phrase creative access is utilized. Because the good news spread most easily through relationships, there are op opportunities for evangelism in even the most difficult of circumstances. Relationships in which the gospel can be shared are developed through students from those countries who study in another country or Christian business people whose job has taken them to those countries, or teachers whose particular specialty is in demand in those countries, or Christian students who go to those countries to study, or tourists who develop contact, contacts during brief trips to those countries, or internet contacts, or literature, or Christian workers imported from third world countries to provide surface neighbors, or Christian radio and television broadcasting from nearby countries, etc. Therefore, we may no longer stereotype missionaries as traditional preachers, missionaries, pioneers, church planters. These are all excellent and very good, but many of the times we, we cannot do that directly. So instead, they may be businessmen, teachers, students, tourists, writers, workers, mass communicators, so forth and so on. Furthermore, the business as mission, we call it BAM, model has developed not only for 10 making missionaries some strategy, strategic roles to stay in the creative access nation, we call it CAN, and to reach local people in a natural way. But BAM now developed global, BAM global. They have been mobilizing local business Christians to involved into God's mission via their business. Really, I, I was, uh, I'm in the board, and uh, sometimes I have to find some businessmen, business Christian, faithful, royal uh, brothers and sisters. Can you set up a, a branch in that <laughs> creative access nation so that we can send missionaries to you as a worker? And they said, well, most missionaries haven't any business training. 
if they would like to go through our access, they have to come to learn intensively how to do the business. Although we are just like NGO, we are not thinking of earning any monies, but at least don't, don't just waste all our resources. That is um, another thing missionaries have to put down their, oh, very high profile, I, I have to save souls. But most of the time you have to have all kind of equip, equip uh, yourself even to be a business person. And maybe you find it is so secular and so waste of your time. Uh, but in fact, you can hang around with local peoples. Your lifestyle is a very great influence to them. Um, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, if we equip and mobilize local Christians to carry on marketplace missions in their cities, they are all potential tent-making lay missionaries to the BAM globally. This will be, uh, this will ch a, a channel and maximize our human resources, lay Christians for global missions in this closed and hostile world. So uh, in our seminary, we have um, programs, ICS programs, full-time and the part-time one. The part-time even have more students. These part-time uh, uh, part students, even uh, after they graduated, even sent by the mission agencies to those creative access nations. So if we have a, a degree, of course we encourage them to come to our seminaries to have a full degrees of uh, intercultural studies, uh, uh, MA uh, or, or MDiv and so forth so on. But uh, many of our students will stay in their professions. They uh, use more years to do the part-time learning. And after they graduate, they can use their profession to go into those kind of uh, restricted areas. So who are missionaries? What are their missionary works? Uh, I, I mentioned Howard Cal Calberson mentioned about internet contacts. Today, we have many social networking tools, like personal computers, iPads, uh, cellular phones, mobile phones, uh, smartphones, YouTube, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Skype, and uh, Google Hangouts, uh, WhatsApps, and QQ, and uh, uh, WeChat, and apps, and etc. Someone old-fashioned like me, due to some urgent um, information I have to pass to my students, three years ago, I began to use Facebook. Ah. <laughs> Believe it or, or not, now I have over uh, 2,700 friends in Facebook. <laughs> wow. ah. What I do it, I, I'm not spending my time uh, having addictions on the online stuff. But through Facebook, I'm able to share my faith, my worldview, my perspectives towards various happenings around the world, redirect our thinking to prayer request, like pray for those countries, peoples, who are experiencing natural disasters like uh, Akoto and uh, Japan, um, and then um, uh, terrorist attacks, persecuted Christians, and suffering churches and missionary uh, their needs around the globe. These are tools for us to use, but it's spend time and effort to learn Today, around 40% of the world population has an internet connection. 
in 1995, it was less than 1%. The number of internet users has increased tenfold from 1999 to 2013. The first billion was reached in 2005. The second billion in 2010, only five years. The third billion in 2014, only four years, is getting quicker and quicker. And nowadays, it's uh, the whole world population is uh, 7.4 billion. Uh, the uh, internet users already 46.1%. It's, it's uh, 3.4 billion people. And I find that the internet users by countries, the first top 20, eight of them are Asian countries. China, India, Japan, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, South Korea, Pakistan. But the penetrations of the populations, you can find that the, the top is Japan. <laughs> The second is uh, South Korea. The third is China. The fourth is Vietnam. The, the fifth is uh, Philippines. Uh, the sixth is uh, India. The seventh is Indonesia. Uh, the eighth is uh, Pakistan. You see, we, we cannot just uh, condemn them, uh, young people. Don't use it, uh, don't, don't be the bow down. Uh, groups and all the time uh, your neck's getting problems uh, you need more exercise and uh, pick up your head uh, we cannot just condemn them you have to use this kind of tools Commi uh, communication technology enhances our world as a global village hence cyber mission becomes such an important strategy for example uh, the Middle East, there's satellite TV like Sat7. I see it, uh, I have three minutes. I can go faster. Sat7 has been doing a great job to illuminate uh, countries in the Middle East, North Africa, Europe, and part of uh, Central Asia uh, to share the God's love since 1996. Uh, you can check uh, from the YouTube and all kind of information. Another example is the website called Answering Islam, a Christian and Muslim dialogue, uh, uh, which created by Western Christians since 1997, but has been adopted by many countries translated uh, over 30 languages. It is very effective in reaching the Muslim, and they feel free uh, to write and argue and ask questions uh, enormously. Another example is uh, from the PRC, the uh, people in Republic China, uh, commonly use WeChat and QQ to communicate. Some Christians inside China, they will further use this kind of platform to set up groups to share their faith, to spread out spiritual materials, and even save some of the groups called su uh, suicide groups. They get in the suicide groups, talk with those young people, and share the bright side, positive side of, the, of life, and then share the gospel with them and uh, lead them to Christ. This is such a huge need. In short, we ought to develop more cyber missionaries to meet this huge need, develop them rhythmically, technically, uh, theologically, and sometimes regarding counseling. Globalization has catalyzed cyber missions and cyber missionaries, a new category.
to us. But another point, aging is also a solid global trend. If mission organizations join hand with churches and seminaries to equip this retired but healthy experienced volunteers, they can be built up as Christian soldiers, although seniors, <laughs> but still healthy. Uh, create a new phenomenon of church or mission field, human resources. Although my study in recent years focuses more on the survey uh, of Hong Kong young missionaries, which was already published on uh, uh, Asia Missions Advance, uh, issue 47, you can check uh, uh, last year, April, uh, that uh, issue. Yet, young Christians are far from being the only group to focus on. The world is aging rapidly. People aged 60 or older make up the whole world's 12.3% of the global population. And by 2050, the number will rise to almost 22%. How to release this kind of seniors experiences and energy to walk with the young and build up the young, they can be partnership. How to rethink about these strategies will be a great blessing for the church. Um, some of the points, because I don't have time, and you can later check my full papers. Uh, I, I'm, I'm jumping. Huh? Mm. What should I say? Oh. Uh, we mentioned about less than 2% those people we send pioneering missionaries. But over 2%, those kind of churches, they're supposed to build their own church, send out their own missionaries, uh, develop uh, Bible schools, systematically train national leaders who pass the baton. Interestingly, there are a, a case of our denomination Christian and Missionary Alliance. Uh, it's quite a different story. According to a Tipman, a reference guide to Christian missionary societies in China from the 16th to 20th century, in, uh, the, uh, they sent earliest two CNMA missionaries to Gansu, choosing the southern part of their field uh, because CIM, uh, the, the China Inland Missions, going to the, south, uh, to the north. But you find that only five years, pioneer evangelism, they built up the Alliance Bible Seminaries. You find that, oh, wow, you shorten the, the time. Uh, you train national leaders, then you shorten uh, the time of uh, sending and receiving and passing the baton. Yes, that is the strategies. Not only relying upon those outsider, foreign missionaries. We have to uh, enhance and uh, accept, uh, uh, escalate to build up the local leaders. So uh, we are thinking about uh, the about, uh, alliance and <laughs> at the last point that uh, we are in the Hong Kong Alliance Bible Seminary. We, are, uh, we have 700 uh, mainland pastors coming out through the uh, free uh, tourists. Uh, one week, we give them modular courses so we can train them, we can equip them how to build up, how to be a missionaries, how to build up mission agencies, how to uh, do the local, national uh, missions and 
gradually foreign missions. I think they can do a better job than us. In conclusion, sorry for the time constraint, I can only highlight uh, a few of the points uh, as above. Our world is changing drastically. As we asked similar questions to our teachers in the past, we shall be asked one day by our students and younger generations, where are our mission fields? Who are our missionaries? Are you called missionaries? You are doing what, what you call mission jobs? Uh, should we support you? Uh, can you raise funds? Uh, can you call yourself missionaries? All these kind of constant questioning and seeking answers. We may be able to find out some innovative ways to do God's mission. May God's mission and passion fill our heart. Thank you.